welcome back for another video. So in the last video we looked at the FPL template, i.e. the highest owned players in the game currently, but that said, higher ownership doesn't necessarily equate to the best players, in fact we had some criticisms for those players. One of the challenges with having a template team is that you gain less rank from points returned by your players, so we're going to take a look at the other side of the coin in this one, exclusively the differentials with the low ownership. We're going for 150k subscribers before game week 1, so if the content is helpful please hit subscribe to support the channel. We've got a big guests coming on the channel this week as well, so you don't want to miss that. So let's get into it, and starting off with Foden. More returns than Bruno last season, and a price cut to 7.5 mil, around 10% ownership. The question with Man City is obviously their expected minutes. In Foden's case, it helps that he can play on the left wing, right wing, or in behind Haaland. De Bruyne is currently out injured as well, so there's a strong chance that we see Foden starting with good minutes at the beginning of the season. Although Grealish made the left wing spot his own towards the end of last season, there's no guarantee that that's the case from game 1. Pep loves to keep his players on their toes. So Sun comes in at 9 mil, which is his lowest price since 2018-19. 10 goals and 6 assists are poor tally by his standards. However, we have learned that he carried an injury for around 8 months of last season. Add to that, new Spurs coach Postacoglu is renowned for attacking football. In fact, at Celtic last season, his team scored 103 goals, the next highest was Rangers with 81. There's nothing to suggest that Sun won't get back to form, and backing in from game week 1 could give an explosive start to the season. Next up is Luis Diaz. I had him in game week 1 last season myself, and he actually did fairly well. Five returns in the opening eight game weeks before picking up the injury that ruled him out for most of the season. The season before that, he signed in January, and he had an immediate impact. So there is some understandable hesitation because Darwin is likely for competition for that spot. Though there's every chance that Diaz will be the first choice left winger heading into the season and 7.5 mil will be a bargain. We'll be monitoring the pre-season lineups and results here on the channel so make sure you subscribe in for those weekly updates. We've got a goalkeeper next which is Flecken from Brentford. They signed him from Freiburg for 11 mil amidst rumours that Rai is on his way out. As a reminder, last season Rye finished as the top scoring goalkeeper in the game with 166 points, so he's commanded a 5 mil price tag. Rye has said a couple of weeks ago that he's ready for the next step and to challenge for silverware, so if he finds the move then Flecken's a cheat code of sorts, as FPL clearly wanted to charge 5 mil for Brentford's number 1. Moving on to our first forward, which is Watkins. Harshly overlooked given how good he was last season. After Emery signed, he went on that run of about 10 game weeks returning every week. Villa clearly an improving side and they've been making some great signings which points towards them only getting better. One of the best things about Watkins is his reliability. Never gets injured and his average minutes for Villa since signing is 3,100 per season. He took 81 shots in the box last season which was 4th highest in the league and he racked up 19 expected goal involvements. Sterling is a debatable pick, but again one bad season doesn't define a player and he's in a similar light to Sun in that respect. He scored over 200 points on three occasions in his career, a proven Premier League quality and his lowest price tag in the last 10 years this season. If Pochettino can get Chelsea back to winning ways and playing quality attacking football then Sterling will be an unbelievable differential at 3.9% ownership. As you're probably aware, Tony is suspended for the first half of this season. The question is who plays striker in his absence? It's unlikely to be in Bumo, who probably will continue playing down the wing. Vissa therefore the potential man to step in. 7 goals in each of his last two seasons despite very limited minutes. Only 6 mil as well, which would make him a perfect second or third forward for any team. If he is indeed the first choice striker then he's locked in for me. It's an awkward position for Brentford as it's not worth signing a striker for half a season and it's unlikely that anyone would be willing to join knowing that, so Vissa or maybe Shader to play as Brentford striker. With McAllister gone, the question is who plays the number 10 role at Brighton? The two main contenders are in Ciso and Gross, however Gross is capable to play as a sit in mid which we didn't see from Enciso last season and Gross also played in right back at times, so there's a strong chance that 5.5 mil on Ciso is De Zerbi's man. McAllister put up elite numbers while he was playing that role, and when Enciso was given the chance he impressed as well. He's got an unbelievable strike on him, he can score from anywhere. Back to a couple of forwards then. It's no secret that Newcastle's fixtures aren't grey, though this generally applies to defenders more than forwards like Trippier. In fact in many cases it can work in the attacker's favour with more space in behind to counter. We saw Newcastle punish City in that fashion last season putting three past them. 
It was an impressive debut from Izak as well, with a return every 126 minutes, and it should only get better and settle in more. 7.5 mil could be a bargain. Okay, so Kane's certainly no hidden gem, and we're barely in differential territory at this point, but he comes in at 12.5 mil, 1.5 mil less than Haaland, and he only scored 9 points fewer, just under 17% ownership. This is no suggestion that you skip Haaland completely and get Kane only. Obviously that's very risky given Haaland's ownership, but given the massive spread of midfielders and lack of forwards, then running with two premium strikers could be a good way to go. Certainly that was the case last season, but most of us started with Haaland and Salah to keep the team flexible. Lastly, this one obviously depends on his future given the links with Bayern Munich. They're referring back to Son earlier in the video. If Kane does leave, then it could benefit his son massively. Another Spurs player next, and in defence, which is Ugodi. The 20-year-old had a successful loan at Udinese last season, three goals and four assists in the league. Both Sessegnon and Perisic played in left wing back last season, but both have been linked with a move away. A 4.5 mil attacking Spurs defender really would be a bargain, and he's a huge differential at this point. Tottenham's pre-season kicks off on the 18th of July, and we'll know more then. Probably another one to monitor on the opposite side for 5 mil. And lastly, it's Gibbs White, who quietly had a great season for Forrest, and he put up more returns than Bruno as well. 5 goals and 12 assists, 17 returns for a side who were battling relegation is really impressive, and he's just 6 mil and 4.3% owned. He's cheap enough that you could even get away with benching him away to Arsenal game at 1. 145 points last season is a respectable score for 6 mil. Thanks for watching. Please hit like before you go if it was useful and make sure you're subscribing as we aim for 150k before Gamit 1. We've got a big guest coming on the channel soon. See you soon for the next one.